This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best-selling book, What School Could Be. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. I am your host, Josh Rapoon. Thank you, listeners, for continuing to support this podcast about innovative, imaginative, and creative educators and education leaders across the Hawaiian Islands. You, my friends, are the reason why we have reached 25,000 downloads in more than 60 countries, which is truly amazing and epic. We are on our way towards a thousand points of light and a more accurate look at what's happening in our public, private, and charter schools. Mahalo. Speaking of a thousand points of light, today my guest is Liana Lamb, who is passionate about community and public schools, viewing both as places to seed and cultivate aloha. Liana's love for public schools sprouted from her time at Ahui Manu Elementary School, where she benefited from loving and dedicated teachers. Liana holds an environmental engineering degree from the University of California, Davis, and a master's in education from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and has worked as an engineer, science teacher, sustainability coordinator, and STEM coordinator. As an educator, she believes in the whole child approach, one that embraces and nurtures the mind, body, and spirit. This belief is most evident in her contributions to building and stewarding the Green Lab at Kaimuki Middle School, an outdoor classroom where she worked with students and teachers to explore Hawaii's environmental sustainability through hands-on, project-based, and experiential learning. More recently, Liana is the co-founder of Pico Pals, a new parent support program that mentors and builds community among parents of newborns. In addition to being a busy mom of three boys, Liana continues to serve public education and community by contributing as the chair to Waialai Elementary Public Charter Schools Governing Board. Liana has her feet firmly planted in both the public and public charter school worlds here in Hawaii, which is why I am so excited to talk to her today. And now, here's my conversation with Liana Lam. Liana, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me here today. So, you know, I've been so looking forward to this interview, Liana. We have only known each other for a short while, but you were amazing and you inspire me a lot. So (laughs) thank you for taking the time today to to do this conversation with me. Oh, thanks, Josh. That's really kind of you to say. (laughs) So, Liana, you are the founder and business designer of Pico Pals, and I'm going to read from your mission statement. Uh, and I quote, Pico Pals creates, coordinates, and cultivates community-based peer groups for new parents in Hawaii. Our goal is to reduce the isolation new parents often feel while offering a supportive environment to cultivate friendships with people experiencing the same joys and challenges. So I have several questions for you about this. So what's the story behind Pico Pals founding? What, what was the epiphany that led you to say, I need to do this. I need to create this. Wow, Josh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that went into it and to unpack. And it, it was such a collaborative effort between me and our co-founders. Um, but I would say the earliest beginning part of it would be just, uh, that transition to new parenthood and sharing your life and dedicating it to to this beautiful child that you love with all your heart and any other job that you thought was so important, mm. it, it, it kind of shrinks in comparison to the role of being a parent in some ways. And um, it's super humbling. And, and we don't know what to do. And we're just kind of thrown into it without any training. And um, I felt really fortunate that you know, I grew up in Hawaii. I'm like fifth generation here. I have lots of family. Uh, I have a college degree. Like in some ways, our family was very privileged and mm. and we had a community around us, but it was still really hard. And I had to develop a ton of new tools in my tool belt. And I did a lot of that with my first one in somewhat isolation because a lot of my friends and community and peers were all at work 
and 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 they though they wanted to help they were in different life stages so as i journeyed through that time and i really kept asking myself um and you'll notice a trend there's a lot of questions and little hypotheses i formulate throughout mm-hmm. my life's journey mm-hmm. i was like why why is this so hard mm-hmm. and right. and how do other people get through it? Like indigenous cultures? <laughs> um, as I went along, I would just collect notes and data and I would just keep analyzing it. Like, why, why, why? And um, pretty much what I recognized got me through it was my ability to love and learn and connect with people. And to me, connecting is just love and action. And I realized uh, sometime throughout Pico Pals, as well as I had some really hard family uh, things going on with, with my parents and, and my brother, um, what helped me get through any of those traumas was holy moly, it's love and learning and connection. Mm. And, um, I, the epiphany was if we could just bring folks together, mm. um, there's such an opportunity for peer support and you can really overcome any kind of challenge. If you have that, that emotionally, intellectually safe mm. community to journey alongside you. And, um, I couldn't, I think I tried to be that for all the friends who had babies after me, Mm. but I had limited bandwidth. And at some point I realized they needed to create their own village. Mm. And if there's some way I could help facilitate that or create stepping stones for it. And so that, that was kind of the birth Um, around that same time. uh, I read a book. (laughs) Josh knows I read a lot of books, Um, a somewhat transformational one, not because of, the content of the book, but more because it came perfectly at a time where I was asking these questions. Mm-hmm. And it was um, Brain Rose for Baby by John Medina. Mm-hmm. And it was it was pretty much like the covers like, so you want to have a smart baby, pretty much. And then like within the first chapter, they're like, psych, um, the, if you really want to have a smart baby, it's not about IQ, it's about EQ, emotional intelligence. Mm. And I, I think as that kind of coupled together with what I was discovering in my own experience, I was like, okay, let me dig a li- little deeper. Yeah. And um, uh, as I was questioning things and I was a little disoriented, I had the, the wonderful privilege of somewhat interning as a grown up with the wonderful folks at the P4C Hawaii group. Mm. And I got to shadow Dr. Jackson, Dr. J yep. for a summer. And just being around them in that emotionally and intellectually safe community and, and learning about how, how you can facilitate and construct and create conditions for this wondering to happen, that, that super, super duper influenced me. And so when I put that together in my brain of power of connection and community and wondering in, a, uh, in, in the elementary school level, Mm-hmm. coupled with oh my gosh there's a puka for this for grown-ups during this really hard transition in their life and when those two ideas married it birthed pico pals mm. and i had help along the way yeah so that's that's actually a perfect segue because my my second question about pico pals is you know because this is an education podcast i'm super curious to know about the long-term educational benefits you've seen when kids and their parents go through a program like Pico Pals, like there, there is what you've seen, I know, and what you hope to see in terms of educational benefits. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Was that on your mind as, as you developed Pico Pals and thinking that these kids are going to be maybe most likely to succeed because of this program? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think we were really, so the co-founders and I, as we all loaned in our little superpowers and um, the program came to take shape, you know, I was a big supporter of teaching. No, teaching's not the word. Um, It's more about kind of a more mindful, self-aware approach to developing the skills to process what's going on in your life and, and, and knowing how to tackle those problems. And I, I've discovered through my readings and experience and triangulations when I talk to people, that's kind of my process as I develop things. Um, and as I triangulated, oh my goodness, like people, just people, humans in general, whether you're big or small, I feel like you can get through anything. And, and maybe I'm still young in my journey. And, and please um, put me straight or like, let, let me know if I'm kind of off the, off the mark here. But I've, I've seen 
folks, like once they develop those processing skills, you can, you really can tackle Mm -hmm. anything. And so if I can kind of seed and help cultivate that, that skill building process with the parents, Mm -hmm. then I would imagine that they would then model that for the children Mm -hmm. because life is hard. I have Mm -hmm. a really privileged life and, and I still have my, my personal struggles and, there's no shortage of problems in this world to tackle, mm-hmm. but I, I, through the process, when I lead groups, I tell them, you know, like, don't focus on getting the right answer. Um, if you could, if you could try to think through what this problem solving process looks like for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then if you have a partner, what it looks like for the, the two of you, because whether mm-hmm. they're not sleeping through the night and you're not feeding them, or if they're like, teenagers and angst and giving you attitude or you're figuring out what college it is or beyond like if you can kind of refine and iterate and get really like get through that process like Mm. um that learning process i would say Mm. then then your you and your whole family will be better off and this is just the start of the journey so again perfect segue liana because in your resume you describe yourself this way, and I'm going to quote, um, self-directed <laughs> okay. learner, self-directed learner and creative problem solver, avid reader, seeker of mentors and thoughtful listener, deeply reflective and self-aware, adept at personalizing knowledge and applying it to overcome challenges. So my question about this is, you know, it's a really lovely thing, Liana, to look back on one's life, even, you know, as young as you are, and I'm still trying to think of myself as young and know that one has become a self-directed learner and creative problem solver. So how did you become these things? Like, what are some small steps you suggest people can take to become more self-directed learners? Oh, oh, wow. Well, first of all, when you said that, I was like, wow, I wrote that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you did. And then oh, and it's so funny that it actually really mirrors what we were just discussing. Indeed. Yeah. Let's see. Well, for one thing, uh, and you'll probably notice this with so many of the people you interview, like we we don't we're still iterating and refining mm-hmm. as as we go in. And um when I told the parents, like, you know. Just you're starting off on this journey to really be mindful of your learning process. Um, I, I'm still going through that. Like Josh, I call you. I call so many folks, and I read so many books because I I don't have the an answer, and I and I'm still very humbled about it. Um, I can tell you a little bit of how I've got to this point in my journey, but I also acknowledge. I still have so much more to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. We all do. Yeah. Um, I think it begins with with listening deeply to what's going on mm-hmm. in yourself. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like we're all so unique as individuals. And so we all have our own learning style and, I, and learning process. <laughs> and um, I know we're speaking to educators and they know this. Like there's so many different children in our classroom and we're differentiating on steroids like every day trying to reach everyone. Mm-hmm. But that also goes to say for ourselves, like we all have our strengths and our shadows and a lot of times they're connected. So I might be deeply thoughtful um, and reflective and empathetic, but then my shadow that's unfortunately connected to that is I can be indecisive. I can get tongue tied. I take a little longer to process. So like, I don't know if I'm insulted <laughs> by somebody <laughs> and I'll be like, uh, wait, did that just happen? And then I have all these questions and like an hour later, I'll be like, mm. that was not cool. And, and, you know, I think this is why. So strength and shadow. And I, I think, um, so I guess, sorry, circling back, it, it would be the deep li- listening piece mm-hmm. right. to yourself, like carving out time for that. And um, also a bunch of ac- acceptance. Mm. And, and that's something, um, neither of those things were things that I was really raised with. Um, I know there's like bits and pieces when I look back, I'm like, huh, I, I was kind of doing this, but I had no formal training. Mm. I think, oh goodness, it, it, yeah, it's just such an evolution. But mm-hmm. if you start paying attention and um, I'm a science engineering person, so I like to think of it as like, you're always making observations and testing these little mm. hypotheses. And mm-hmm. then you just keep going back and back and it's okay if you don't have the right answer, mm. but you keep trying and slowly you get closer and closer. So I, I feel like I'm finally at a point where I've, 
I can actually like describe my own personal learning process mm. and, and share with others that it's valuable to know your process and then um, encourage other people to discuss yeah. them right. and this approach in people pals, as well as like with my friends and colleagues, I will never tell you what your process is. Like mm. that's something I feel you, you have to figure out on your own to trial and error and mm-hmm. Like the only way to get it is like, you have to go through it and you have to hit those walls. We see that all the time in Pico Palace. Like you have to hit that wall and then make a change. Yeah. Um, and yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I love the idea that when you face a challenging situation, that it is your process to wait and to be a self-directed learner, to ask questions, to go back and re-listen to what it was that you hear or heard, and then to, you know, begin to think through like, what were the ramifications of that? I mean, I think that that's pretty profound, actually. And as a step that somebody (laughs) can take, you know, that's just something that you can implement. And so, and I also heard, and this is, this leads me to my next question that, you know, you're a reader, and um, obviously, Mm. maybe it's not obvious, but But self-directed learning starts in a number of different places. And in my mind, it starts with reading because there you are, right? You're in the middle of somebody else's thinking. So in your resume, you know, as I read earlier, you describe yourself as an avid reader. So what are two recent books you've read that really got your head and your heart fired up? Oh, yeah. Maybe not so super, super recent, but I will say um, maybe maybe like three or year, three years ago or something when we were developing Pico Pals partway through that time, um, a good friend of mine uh, gave me a copy of Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. And that, that one was a, a huge game changer for me because that helped me understand myself and maybe what was going on in a lot of the new parents minds as you know because we had these emotionally safe communities and they would share the inner workings of their minds and their experiences and and I would too and as I listened to them it helped me make sense of the mechanics behind what I was observing mm, wow yeah it was like the the whole and for those of you who I, I maybe aren't super familiar with the book but I imagine a lot of you guys are um it's really understanding courage and connection as an antidote to shame and it does a deep dive into shame Mm. and it helped me understand what all the barriers in in my personal life and with my own personal personality and so when I talked about coming to terms with like me and my learning style and and how I I work through problems like that that was a really important time in my life where I was like oh this Mm. is what's going on and I stopped judging myself or not working through problems the way I perceived mm. other people to, if, if that makes sense. It does. Like, you mm. know, you, like in Pico Pals, we feel like everyone, especially I, I guess for new parents, like you, you see the new mom who looks really smiley with their cool stroller or whatever, like you think they all have it together. Mm. And when we peel that away in our communities and we discuss it, like you realize nobody has it together. <laughs> and then we all, I mean, and then we all deal with it our own way. So yeah. that, that yeah. book was huge. Terrific. Yeah. What's another one? Oh gosh. What's another one? Josh, I, you planted this question with me like a long time ago and I, well, and, okay. We, the honest thing is I, um, it's like the children, right? Like, like you can't really pick, no. pick, pick, pick your favorites. Well, let me, let me pick one for you because it's one that <laughs> okay, I, okay. that I recommended, which is, um, a beautiful question, a more beautiful question. Oh, yes. and I think you just finished that, right? I just finished that. Oh, mm-hmm. that was a lovely one. And, and thanks for planting that one with me too. I wouldn't say it changed any trajectories for me. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's why I didn't put it on the list as like a life changing type one. But I will say that one really validated what I had Mm beat, what I had been seeing in education circles and facilitation. So like, there's like, I'm a big fan of design thinking. And when I realize like, Oh, there's a framework for this that like has posters and training. I'm like, Oh, this is what I've been doing. I've been design thinking my life. There you go. (laughs) <laughs> and then um, the same thing. So I would marry that with um, there's, I'm really influenced by 
Bernice McCarthy's format lesson planning curriculum. And it's all about, besides being brain-based, it's also like taking kids on this learning journey where you do why, like, why is this important? And then the what, and then the how, and then the if, what if, and extend. And it was so funny that I, I think that book came out in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and I did the training in like the early two thousands when I was a newer teacher. And then I, when I read a more beautiful question, you see that same progression and connections to design thinking and the power of questions. There's another book called, uh, was it Great Leaders Ask Great Questions or or something to that effect by John Maxwell. Mm -hmm. And when I first got turned on to the the power of questioning um, and and guiding and supporting myself and other people, (laughs) again, you know, Pico Pal style where I don't have the answers for you. You discover the question and I just hold space for it. Mm -hmm. And so when I connected all of those, it, it was neat to see the same process outline in a more beautiful question. Mm. And so it just fueled like my, uh, the, the validation and like my commitment to like, I think, I think we're onto something. Mm. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And that, that was my reaction to a more beautiful question as well as that it, it really validated something that had been inside of me for a long time. And that's what I love about some books is some, you know, give you completely new knowledge and some validate what you've been thinking about for a while. Yes. And they put like a framework to your thinking. Yes. And right. then they connect in like all this other evidence-based research. <laughs> right. It, it's funny because there's so many, you realize like there's so many other people working on the same question yeah. and the books help you find who those other people are and right. where they're at in their inquiry. And then you just kind of put it, it helps shape where, where you go. Right. And that's, that's an awesome, an awesome idea because, you know, building a network of people, um, which is, you know, a real key ingredient to being successful in life, in my opinion, um, building, building that network around people who are addressing similar questions or people who are addressing other questions, you know, is really a, an interesting process. And I, and I, when I read it, I just looked back and thought, there are all these people that I've been working with over the years who've been focused on all these questions. What are those questions, you know? And and mm-hmm. I want to have conversations with them. So that's that's very cool. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears for a second, but. Mm-hmm. Um, Kind of keeping on the line of of questions because I'm sure that what you did um, at Kaimuki Middle School was really based on questions. So for a moment, I want to dig into your work at Kaimuki Middle, where you served as STEM coordinator and sustainability coordinator, and a Planeteer Club founder advisor, <laughs> and you founded um, Kaimuki Middle School's Green Lab Outdoor Classroom and Innovation and STEM Center through writing grants and coordinating community support and workdays to build the lab itself, and you collaborated with teachers to create and teach standards-based sustainability-themed units and created the school's sustainability program uh, plan, which meant you could lead your fundraisers towards what that goal was and and being able to support the program. So um, I think our listeners would want to know, Liana, more about your Green Lab and STEM Center. Like, where did the idea originate from? And what was the process of bringing it to life? Like, what what was the smallest step taken early on that marks a moment when the Green Lab slash STEM Center was about to come to life? The earliest step was, it always starts with the, the students. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like we're we're there to serve the students. And, and I guess my teaching philosophy is I do a lot of kid watching and having conversations with them. And mm. so what happened is we started our Planeteer Club and that comes from, and then this might be another, <laughs> a whole other conversation, but, but I did spend about three or four years as an environmental engineer and that's my background. So sustainability, cleaning up waste, cleaning the air and the water. That's something I've been curious about since a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how it manifest, manifest here in, in our science classes and whatnot. Like we did start our Planet After School Club, uh, trying to build and reconnect kids, our city kids. I grew up in Kaneohe um, where you're immersed in green. And then mm-hmm. now I live in Kaneki and it's a much different experience. And our students are experiencing something different, but um, just reconnecting them to the Aina mm-hmm. and, uh, our club kids, who I also happen to have 
in science class would say, Miss Lamb, it is not fair. Why do you take the planeteers outside to garden and do stuff outside? And we don't do this in our classroom. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, yeah, why why don't we? And as we explore that question, Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, it's really hard to teach outside. There's distractions. There's like changing weather. there's, There's all of this. But the kids were like, I was like, do you still really want to go there? And they're like, yeah, come on. And so I I was inspired Mm -hmm. and I love being outside naturally. So then we we kind of went through surprisingly looking back very much a design thinking Mm -hmm. process where we just asked questions and kind of started building our vision. And that was before I even knew what that was. I was just acting really instinctually. And I was fortunate to have engineering training Mm -hmm. where we just intuitively would approach things mm-hmm. any pro- like you know engineers we solve problems and we have a process and what are the existing conditions who do i need to talk to um what what like how are we going to solve this problem let's propose a couple of ideas let's talk with our client like and choose when so so all of that i just instinctually did and then um it i guess when question always led to the next one like okay if this is what we want to do then where are we going to get the money? And I think I'm a very open person. <laughs> like I'm, I'm very open to, to help. And so I, we're so lucky. And that's why, you know, like the whole thing about community mm-hmm. support and peer support, like that's how so much of this magic happens. I, I don't have the answer. I just have a question. And mm-hmm. as we work through it, it almost sends a little beacon out or it, people are revealed to us helpers along the way mm. and they help us get there. So Kokua foundation was one of our biggest supporters. Mm. Um, and my inner circle of friends would help validate the idea. And of course the students would, and mm. um, we had a wonderful school leader who <laughs> took a chance and was open with it when we pitched the idea. That's... And as time went on, right. We're, yeah. we're just, encouraged and again collecting data and refining and it the living classroom that is our green lab it it evolves and so I took some years out to raise our children and then when I came back by then I had read some things and I had some other experience under my belt so in building our STEM and innovation center we were a lot more intentional in the process Mm. and um And that's, I think that's something we'll be sharing when we present at the Schools of the Future conference at the end of the month. That's terrific. That's awesome. So, so Liana, climate change is a, is really a freight train that's barreling down on us with frightening speed. Um, Where does your passion for sustainability come from and, and what do we need to do to get it front and center on the educational agenda? Ooh. I know. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I said it takes me some time to unpack? Nah, but um, uh, what I can say just like in- instinctually is I'm a firm believer. And, and there's like a, a, a really wonderful little hui of teachers that I work very closely with at our school. Uh, it, it's like my Pico Pal group, but mm-hmm. we're teaching <laughs> at Carbon Key Middle. And mm-hmm. we have these questions and we ask it and wonder together. And then when we test out different things that might seem out of the school culture a little crazy, uh, we dust each other off and pick each other up. And we hold space for, I know, this is how change happens, Josh. You can't do it by yourself. I've seen it. I've seen you parents transition in the hardest of times in in a life-changing event. And I've seen how they were able to do it. And so I'm much more intentional in using that same process myself. But anyway... um, Uh, Back to your question about climate change, that that would be my approach. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, I I was not formally trained with like the answer (laughs) of climate change. Um, But I'm a big believer in we can all do our little bits of good where we are. Mm -hmm. And it's those little bits of good put together that really overwhelm the world. That's a Desmond Tutu quote. And I feel like our role as educators and teachers, um, you know, we can... It, it's our students' future. And if for those of us who are parents, it's our kids' future. And maybe what we can do is help hold space for them to develop the skills to tackle these mm-hmm. these big, big problems. And I'm not expecting them to like have the same kind of inquiry like our people, pals, new parents, but just 
uh, starting to ask the questions, um, being okay and comfortable not having the answer. <laughs> We rarely have the answer, but um, but but going through that problem solving process. So what we are attempting, this is our hypotheses, at, at least with the the group of folks that I'm I'm working with, is how might we reduce the carbon footprint of of our school? And so we're trying to again with. The little bit, bits of good that I have as a teacher and with my colleagues, we're, we're starting to ask that question and encourage each other on this inquiry. Um, some of us haven't really taught a lot of climate change. Um, some of us haven't, like we have, but maybe we haven't accessed or used a lot of like Hawaii, like Hawaii real data to, to paint some points. Maybe there's we're working with some newer nonprofits to our school and bringing them in as the experts. So. Kind of, you probably mm -hmm. see a lot of parallels. Like this is a very same process to this path that I've walked a lot in in my personal life. Like start with the question, mm -hmm. hone that question, right? Like design yep. thinking, clarify, define the problem, mm -hmm. and then like start like hypothesizing, start formulating what your prototypes are going to be. So yeah. um, I think we're in the process right now of. Learning what are some of the environmental challenges in our little Kaimuki Middle and Kaimuki community, um, just so it can connect to the the hearts of the children and their day to day experience. And then we'll start figuring out like how might we want to do what we can in our little bits of good mm -hmm. or uh, in our little way um, mm -hmm. to to help make the mark. And so I'm not so much interested in so solving the the climate change problem necessary though that is a big problem but i i'm more trying my goal is more to help them develop that process of yep. asking problems or excuse me asking questions and trying to solve their own problems because mm. that's a skill that will serve them and they're just going to keep honing that as time goes on yeah. or at yeah. least that's my hope that's that's really cool you know my probably most important mentor in my life 50 years ago when i was at punahou school and um, you also went to Punahou School as well. His name was Paul Dockberry. Um, and 50 years ago, Liana, he was asking that same question. How, how, how might we reduce our carbon footprint? And this was long before anybody was really even paying attention to climate change. And, and what he started at Punahou School is actually quite extraordinary and led to the building of buildings that have the, the, you know, famous LEED certification and so on. So I'm, I'm very inspired that you're doing that at Kaimuki Middle. Um, and so, and, and also, you know, the, the most important point is that you're doing it together with other educators, um, in a network and that you're talking to each other and figuring out how you're going to move this forward. Um, and so that's something I think our listeners can definitely take away from today is that notion of networking with people and working with people and asking questions with other people to figure out where you, where you go forward. So that's, that's very cool. It's not just like the internal community of the school, it's external community too. I, I just wanted to make that yeah. point because we can't solve it, any problem without help. And I, I truly believe it's the community supports that mm -hmm. are the secret sauce that take a school from good to great. Mm -hmm. That's also part of the hypotheses I'm, I've been testing the mm -hmm. last couple of years. And I think that it's something that we can do to measure the success of schools is to look at the number of partnerships that they have in their communities oh. because that that reflects the kinds of things that they're working on in the school is that they're reaching out to these community partners that's something that i learned from a teacher at alawai elementary um, was this notion that the school really highly valued its partnerships and that it, it wanted to judge itself based on the quality of those partnerships so your point is well taken that's that's an awesome oh. awesome idea yeah that's neat. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, everyone, let's take a minute to reintroduce today's guest. Liana Lam is the chair of Wailai Elementary Public Charter Schools Governing Board and a science teacher and STEM coordinator at Kaimuki Middle School here on Oahu. So, Liana, I want to go backwards in time and, and have some fun and talk about a short course you taught at Hanahaoli School which is a small, small, private, Dewey-inspired school on Oahu. Um, you taught a student-centered cooking chemistry class with bacteria and fungi food safety experiments, yeast explorations, including bread making, and a field trip to Latour Bakehouse. So 
I was like, what? That's that sounds awesome. And and how fun that must have been. And I'd love to know a little bit more about that. But but then I started thinking, why was this a summer course and not a year-long deep dive as part of the regular curriculum, right? So anyway, what what was that course like and, and what kind of fun did you have? Oh, that was so fun. And you know, I actually didn't know a whole lot about Hanaholi <laughs> until until I started having children and one of my really close friends, actually two of my really close teacher friends have uh, eventually found their way to teaching at Hanaholi. So we're always comparing notes mm, and, that's awesome. and the different landscapes in which we function and which, which uh, ideas we can, we can carry back with us. So, so I actually didn't really seek out that job. Mm-hmm. It was that my really good friend who happened to be the summer school director that year. And she's like, Liana, you teach in this style. Come hang out with us for a summer. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh, sure. But I just do my thing. And yeah, so so that that was a lot of fun conversations. Uh, but she twisted my arm. And so I went there, partially because at the time I had leaned out of teaching full time to raise our kids. Mm-hmm. So that was a really nice way for me to get in while still being able to be present for our young children mm-hmm. um, at the time. So Oh, that was a fun class. <laughs> mm. uh, that was an amazing community to be part of, actually. So so what I tend to do sometimes is my brain kind of shifts from macro to micro and macro to micro. Mm-hmm. In some ways, I feel like I'm balanced. I know that sounds a little schizophrenic, but I feel like I'm a very middle kind of person. I'm not a very extreme person. So that goes with like parenting choices, teaching philosophies, my approach to life. But... It also applies to the way I analyze and experience things. Mm -hmm. So on a macro side, when I went there, I really took a deep dive into school culture and school design. Mm -hmm. And eventually that connected me to leadership. And I already had Mm -hmm. that hypothesis about community support. So it was really interesting to like test out that part of my brain. And then on the more micro side, I got to teach this amazing course. And so well, Hanaholi, at least um, they do have some standard courses at the teach that they have to offer. And then they also, at least at that time, that summer school director, who's my good friend, her philosophy was teach something that you love yeah. and you can create your own course. So she's like, Liana, I trust you. I know, I know you for years and your philosophy. Go pitch something to me and I'll let you know if that'll resonate with our community. So um, my, my husband's family is in the food business. And, and so we've had connections with KCC and that was after Mm. a lot of our building the green lab and our sustainability efforts at Carnegie middle school. And so I was able to bring that back into the science class and funny thing you should ask, because what would that be like for a year long course? Josh, I I'm trying (laughs) to do that this year. (laughs) Oh really? So yeah, it's all part of the journey. I, there's a, a lot of behind the scenes analysis that goes on through all my experiences. So, I'm trying to take a lot of those things and and do that here. And in our innovation center, mm. we when we were building it, our our first question was, how might we enhance the learning at Kaimiki Middle School? How might we create a space uh, for the community here to enhance what's mm-hmm. already going on? We mm. don't need another library. We have a killer music program. Like, what could this space be for mm. you folks? Right. And um, through that process, they identified uh, a food lab. Mm. Because they said that one of their most meaningful experiences is cooking in the classroom. And then they justified all the reasons why wow. it was meaningful learning. Yeah. So right. I can actually do this because we've had years of grant writing and supplies and equipment. And we've had years of partnerships with KCC, mm. our next door neighbor culinary. So they've already talked to our teachers and we've already been scheming and writing grants together. And so for the climate conscious inquiry, um, a component might be what's it called making personal choices to a slightly more plant-based diet mm. and bonus points if the plants you're purchasing are local or we're growing it mm. ourselves. And then there's all the science there. So when you ask me about the fungus bacteria, mm. uh, like the FBI type explorations, oh yes, we're going to be composting. Oh yes, we're going to be looking at all of this under the microscope that we got as donations from JT Technologies in California because sometimes our community is even farther away but they are the secret sauce that help us do what wow. we do. So I could really get into this, but I, I'll stop mm-hmm. there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just say it was an amazing experience. And, and this inquiry is continuing on when I, when I meet with my girlfriends. Like, what, what is this secret sauce there at Kanaholi? I know their landscape is totally different. Their resources are different. But mm-hmm. what can we learn from that experience that might benefit our public school community? Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm always looking for those leverage points where to put my energy towards. Um, the community partnerships is one. Yeah. Right. And and I, here I'm going to put in a plug for uh, Hanaholi School because my former student um, at Punahou, uh, Amber Strong Makayao, is actually the director of their professional development center. And I think that that's one of the truly great programs in the country for helping teachers develop in the progressive Dewey style of inquiry learning. Um, and you can learn more about it by just going to Hanaholi's website. Um, and that's, that's really fantastic what you're doing at Kaimuki, Liana. I, you know, have a background. My first career was as a chef. Um, and that whole experience 45 years ago really did inform my life. And I, and I think like a prep chef, that's who I was. I was never a frontline guy. I wasn't the guy, you know, sauteing with the mm. flames going up in the air and all that. <laughs> I was the guy in the background helping arrange things for people. Um, and I love the idea that, you know, a project like that or, or a food lab or a course like that over the course of has so many sort of peripheral benefits to it b- besides just cooking. And, you know, there, yeah. there are elements of chemistry, there are elements of personal development. There's all of these kinds of things that, that come into play. And that's, that's really great. And, and that's a great segue to what I wanted to ask you next, which is, Jumping forward in time, um, I wanted to ask you about grants that Kamuki Middle School received from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Public Schools of Hawaii Foundation. And these grants, you said to me, and I quote, it feels so good to have resources and support from colleagues. So what are these two initiatives and, and what are the small or medium steps you and your colleagues have taken to be in a position to move these initiatives forward? Let's see. Can can you see that? Sorry. <laughs> so let's let's take the Noah the Noah one first. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. Can you break it down a little? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the Noah program about, and what was the grant that you got, and what's that program going to be? Okay. Okay. So that that's what I spent my summer doing, continuing on this inquiry with with our colleagues of like, oh goodness. Oh, we are also very influenced. Thank you for getting us ten copies of. Of yeah. what school could be, mm-hmm. because that kind of brought up a lot of questions for for our school community awesome. um, and and the teachers that wanted to wonder alongside me. Mm-hmm. But we're like, goodness, if we wanted to do more uh, purposeful, hands on, inquiry based learning, and and really make change in our community, what what might be the best approach? And through asking those questions, uh, what when I looked at all of our experience in the past, both as my role. Uh, as sustainability coordinator and um, science teacher. And then what I've experienced like at Wailai and Pico Plaza, and I kind of put that all together. Mm -hmm. Um, And even this past year, as we're building the STEM center and asking these questions to the kids and, and also listening to what's resonating with the teachers as well. Oh my goodness. Like Mm. food, (laughs) food seemed to be, uh, uh, I don't know if a leverage point is, but, but a point of interest, almost like a really, easy first stepping stone Mm -hmm. because even if teachers weren't comfortable doing inquiry or project-based learning, they were comfortable with food Mm -hmm. and they could all relate and everybody had a story. And so they were willing to make that first step, Mm -hmm. come out and teach in the classroom, have a, have less, or excuse me, teach, come out to the green lab and do some lessons in the garden, Mm -hmm. come out and do like, they would stretch for food. Mm -hmm. Other things I didn't see that comfort level with teachers or kids. There was an interesting excitement around food. So we thought, oh, goodness, as our journey towards a more um, purposeful, innovative type learning landscape, inquiry based, we're like, maybe that's the first stepping stone. We have community resources and partnerships that we could lean on. And we have a pretty good track record. And then the the more making that food thing a little bit more, maybe not relevant, but connecting it to climate consciousness. That's where like the Mm. plant-based diet, like, huh, maybe Mm. again, I don't have the answers. And this is like the inquiry we're doing as we speak and, and we have to be flexible with how it meanders, but, but that's kind of where we're at. Um, Knowing that 
like after many conversations at the end of last school year and some analysis and talks over the summer, we're like, gosh, if we're going to do this, we're going to need some money and we're going to need some resources for equipment, Mm -hmm. um, professional development. Like what do, what do we need to make this happen? What, what do we need to, to set ourselves up for success? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I, I, I have friends. I don't have like a ton of friends. I'm not like a super connector, but I do hold the few near and dear to my heart. And so they made suggestions for good idea grant as well as um, the, NOAA, the NOAA Ocean Guardian Grant. Mm-hmm. And so they are helping us explore the environmental needs of our Kaimuki community and they're supporting student-centered projects as we go through the design thinking or scientific method process or just, uh, and for those classes partnering with us who aren't science-based, but just like social studies or our Hoiana Project Aloha class, um, they're jumping in more from an inquiry framework Mm-hmm. But just what what are possible solutions our our kids can come up with to put our love of the land in in mm-hmm. action and, and what what we do in our yeah what might we do to reduce our carbon footprint mm-hmm. so yeah I I hope that answered your question absolutely and I'm so inspired by the idea that that you keep all of you are grounding yourselves in the sustainability initiative. Um, and that, that really the questions that you're asking come out of that. I mean, anything to do with food is ultimately going to work its way back to sustainability, especially yeah. here in Hawaii, because it's so much on our mind. And I love the idea that you were, you, you use the food part as a sort of entrance or an entryway so that you could get you know, more comfortable with things as you move forward and maybe bigger goals for different types of programs. And ultimately when that leads to like being an ocean guardian, oh my God, you know, I how, know, how right? amazing and, and how amazing really, because as you said at the very beginning of our conversation, it's all about the kids. And so if they get to have these experiences and this is happening here, you know, in Kaimuki, wow, you know, what, what's possible elsewhere? <laughs> you know, the impossible is nothing, you know, you know that phrase, right? Um, the climate conscious inquiry, I, I was torn when writing grants for that mm-hmm. because of my, my philosophy and student centeredness. Ideally, those original questions would have come from them. Mm. And then I also at the same time had other questions that I had to wrestle with with my colleagues of what are the needs of the kids right now? Yeah. And um, we had already settled on, you know, folk, and largely influenced by the innovation playlist and, and what schools could be and, and things like that. And oh gosh, creating innovators and all these other books and experiences that we, we put together. Mm. Um, we, we, we knew we wanted to focus more on the, the problem solving process, the, the how versus the, the how versus like the what and content base. Um, but we wrestled with some of the needs of the kids returning from the pandemic are the social emotional mm. needs. Yes. And so absolutely. we did spend some time discussing like, do we make the problem that we're solving climate consciousness, like climate change, or do we focus more on SEL? And one of my colleagues, one of my dearest, uh, for those of you who watched that, the, the that dance partner movie about the, the crazy, how to start a movement. Yes. Through dance. Um, mm-hmm. my, my number one dance partner, Don Okimoto, and I, and an also mom friend, because mm-hmm. we had children around the same time. We are really, really close. She, she said, well, why can't we do both, Miana? Oh, there and you I go. was like, oh, <laughs> so that's, that's how we made peace with what are the real needs of the kids. Yeah. right now in this moment of time. So we are trying to embed as many SEL type, like student leadership collaboration lessons in it. Uh, we don't always do it well and we don't always nail it, but mm. that's the that's the goal in our heads. And we try our best to embed resiliency and, 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 and SEL type things along the way. That's fantastic. That's great. So, hey everyone, stay with us. After this short break, we will come back with more questions for Liana Lam. Hi friends, Toy Hirschman here from the Entre Ed Talk podcast. I am super excited to support the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast hosted by none other than the amazing Josh Rapoon. And I also want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible educators in Hawaii who are doing unreal things in the entrepreneurship and design-based thinking spaces. I hope you all subscribe and listen to What School Could Be in Hawaii. And also, hey, 
why not check out the EntreEd Talk podcast where we interview stellar entrepreneurial educators and entrepreneurs from across the country and globe. I cannot wait to connect with you. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, and we are back with Liana Lamb, the chair of Wailai Elementary Public Charter Schools Governing Board and a science teacher and STEM coordinator at Kaimuki Middle School here on Oahu. So Liana, in this final section of our conversation today, I want to focus on leadership. And I'm, I'm facilitating a school leadership course and, and hope to have my cohort participants listen to this part of our conversation. Um, well... <laughs> No pressure. No pressure at all, <laughs> no, pressure. no. So you do so much as an educator and leader at Kaimuki Middle School, um, but remarkably, you also lead the Wailai Governing School Board, a public charter school consisting of about 500 students, 40 plus teachers, and an operating budget of about $4.5 million. So you and your board are currently searching for a new school director slash CEO. And here in 2021, as opposed to, say, you doing your search 20 years ago, what are the skills, habits, and dispositions of the school leader you want and need at YLI? Or maybe another way to ask this is, you want someone who is both an effective leader and a wise leader. So what does wise school leadership look and sound and feel like to you and your board? Oh, yeah. Um... First, first of all, thanks for the major props on on leadership and all the things that I'm juggling. Um, uh, just as a disclaimer for those who, who may be listening, I, I actually personally struggle with the the term leader and that label leader, and I'm slowly getting more more comfortable with it through the help of my my peer group mm-hmm. <laughs> and my and my dear friends. And Josh and I have talked privately about about just like oh that's. Like, like for me, I kind of think of someone on a, a soapbox who's like really confident speaking and being really decisive. I don't know. We're all crazy in our own way. And I, I guess I have certain images that I conjure up and I'm trying to reprogram that. And so part of my own, I, I do have a little side personal inquiry that I've been uh, trying to wrestle with of just leadership and, and am I a leader and what does it mean to be a leader? So mm-hmm. perhaps those are some of the questions that, your, your, your cohort that you're working with are maybe wrestling with well, Absolutely. as well. Or maybe they've already gotten through that, but mm, I'm no. still trying to get comfortable in my own skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, on that, <laughs> on that note, uh, and feel free, we could do a deeper dive on that another day, but um, for, for while I, and, and our CEO search, oh goodness. Well, for one thing, um, I, I may be the chair and, and I know that sounds like, prestigious and all that again part of why I feel a little comfortable with the term leader but um uh it's not all up to me it's up to our board and the strength of our board is that we are a group of community members when I remember when I talked about the secret sauce of taking good schools to great Mm -hmm. oh my goodness our board they are so thoughtful and we we all have different skill sets, strengths and shadows that we bring to the table. And, and we serve as a, a think tank for the CEO. And um, we do hire and evaluate our school leader, which is a privilege <laughs> and a huge responsibility that we do not take lightly. And so when I speak, please know like this is just my, my own little one person vote kind of thing. Um, and we actually have uh, established a CEO search committee um, with stakeholders from across our school, like so board members, um, parents, uh, our foundation folks, like our, our, our parent group, um, as well as faculty and staff. And together, they're doing the deeper dive in what we're looking for as a uh, in, in our next CEO to to shepherd us into the I guess the current and next phase of our organization or mm-hmm. of our school. Yeah. So um, I don't. 
I'm not in all of those discussions. I'm overseeing that the process moves, but I'm not in the nitty gritty. Um, I will see on a more global, global hope. We're really looking for somebody who embodies our mission and our vision. And I, I, I don't have like the verbiage right here in front of me, but I, but I will say we are like front and center. We are a student centered school that honors the whole child. And, and so we're really, mm. there's such an opportunity there for, you know, like I feel like a lot of schools not to, not to like judge it. Please don't ever take this as judging because I recognize schools are really complicated and messy uh, organizations. I've learned so much in this role. When you look under the hood of a school, it's, it's never like clean and perfectly neat. <laughs> it's, there's, it, it's so complex as more functions more as an organism than a machine. Um, but that being said, like we're all striving for different things, but we're all at different places in our journey and the cast of team, like our team members and our resources evolve over time. So everything's kind of in motion. <laughs> so mm -hmm. not judging that, but I will say, um, like for, for our mission and, and yeah, like, we, we really strive to be student centered and focus on the whole child. We have things in our um, structures in our school design from like the way we collaborate, like the, the amount of time is uh, dedicated to collaboration time and professional development for teachers. Um, the, the, the board structure, the different committees that are set up, like the way, just the culture of the school are very collaborative and we are always looking for um we're always listening to our stakeholders and where they are and that helps us it helps our board triangulate any decisions that we make mm -hmm. and we're not ever serving a specific stakeholder group and so um we i mean well well we definitely put the kids first so, so i will say some some carry a little bit more weight than others but we definitely triangulate across mm -hmm. and oh gosh that's something decision making is a whole another thing but um we are looking for someone who uh, lives and breathes and has, uh, and if we look into their history, we, we should hopefully be able to see concrete evidence and experience and decisions that they've made in their life that mm. really show their belief and dedication. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. That's awesome. And I, I, I love the idea that everything is focused on finding that person who embodies the whole child approach. And therein lies the wisdom of the leader that you're looking for is that they understand that that's the focus is the, the child the whole child and and so i think i think that's fantastic and i i wish you and your board all the luck in the world in finding that person um i feel like here in 2021 your chances are way higher than they used to be of finding that whole child wise leader um and because we've come so far as a culture we have really come a long ways in terms of focusing on who our kids are and, and how their individual and collective development, you know, is something that's very holistic. Um, so that's, that's going to be, I think it'll be a good thing. It'll work out well for you and you Thanks. and your board. Um, so Liana, I want to close and while wow, this time has gone by so fast, I want to close by referencing um, another leader out there, Edna Hussey, who's the principal at Mid Pacific's um, Mid Pacific Institute's elementary school, and I want to ask you about an article. I just did an episode with her. She was episode one of of this third season. Um, so I want to ask about an article you read um, by Edna, and in the article, which is in Hawaii Parent Magazine, uh, Dr. Hussey warns education policymakers against forcing kids to read through scripted programs and and other types of highly controlled programs in which it's they're very content heavy and she's warning about doing this too early and she's also warning about the idea that studies are already showing that if you do this very early um, kids love of reading and writing will plateau very early and that they won't really progress beyond that and so she's advocating for something she refers to as quote reading the world which is a holistic whole child approach to reading and writing through experiential learning like be involved in projects and building and creating and and designing and then the reading and writing will come along with it so i'm curious to know what you think about dr hussey's position given that you actually read that piece 
Yeah. And and I also happen to be a mom of three boys who mm-hmm. are like 10 and seven and three. So we've, we've gone through that reading process on a personal level mm-hmm. as well. And, and you know me, Josh, I totally read a lot of books and articles about <laughs> yes, this. Yes, you have. So, yeah. so it, what she's describing is very much research based and, and maybe it depends on what research you're, you're looking at, but at least the ones that, that I was looking at, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. And I, and I wholeheartedly, when I read her article, yeah, I was, it, the context is so, so important. Mm-hmm. Um, but the challenge, and, and I think the, the research that I read said more, you know, a child can learn anything. We all can learn anything, but it's, um, it's most, if we, we learn most efficiently when it's developmentally appropriate as well as like, it's what we need at that time. So on a mm-hmm. scientifically like developmentally appropriate, but also personal meaning appropriate. And, and I, as an engineer, I'm all about efficiencies and mm-hmm. return on investment and like um, what, what makes the most sense. So uh, putting on that, that lens, I'm like, yeah, if, if they're going to more readily accept this information and this skill at a different time and maybe the time that they're in as like a really young child is better spent uh, being creative and enjoying learning and, and just practicing words at like, like that, that, <laughs> mm-hmm. sorry. And, and not being an elementary or younger L teacher, just a parent of young children. I, mm-hmm. I, I see that. And I, I believe that. And I definitely believe that. Um, I would say though, it's, it's one thing to have like the why and what, but it's also like the practical reality of what the classroom looks like. Sometimes that's really, really hard. And that's actually something that we're discovering in our climate conscious inquiry. The, the planning side, the, uh, our own personal ability as a teacher to be flexible and adapt on the fly and manage the mechanics of hands-on learning with tools and dangerous, like it's just, it's not always practical. So remember mm-hmm. when I told you I'm kind of a ba- balanced person. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and then I, I kind of, I see both, both ends of the spectrum and I'm always looking for ways that we can kind of meet in between. And um, like, I, I just don't want to come down hard on the teachers who are doing this more, mm-hmm. this, this old, older fashion, slightly more traditional style. Like there's a reason why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. There's something they're working working well for them that's serving them and i'd be curious <laughs> i'd be curious like what is it what elements of their existing program is working and how might we mm. leverage that or utilize that as we start moving in the direction that edna is mm-hmm. talking about because mm-hmm. though i wholeheartedly agree with yeah that that's great but how the challenge is always in the how josh yeah. I think this is why lately i've been fascinated with leadership and i I really look up to the really brave souls that step into school leadership because it's one thing to read it in a book and be inspired. Yep. But how do you do this in real, in the real world with real people, with their own unique strengths and shadows and imperfections um, in the school landscape that you're functioning in? Every school has its own culture and design and structures. Some we can change and some that we cannot. And, how, how do you, how do you be like water and find those little cracks so you can like mm-hmm. break down the dam little by little? Like I, yeah. So anyway, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm going off the deep end, but I just, um, yes, I agree, but I'm also curious on, on how might we support any educators to move in that direction mm-hmm. and why is, why are things serving them as is? And I think that that's an absolutely fantastic way to tie a bow on this, Liana, because that's, that's an, you know, we talk about wise leadership. I think what you've just said is a very wise thing, which is we, it oh, doesn't, <laughs> it, it doesn't serve us to exclude people that we think are not doing it the wrong way yeah. um, or the right way. And that the way to do it is to be inclusive and to pull people together and to go back to a more beautiful question to ask, what is your purpose? What are you doing in this particular moment? What are your objects? And then they, if they do the same thing with you, then we've started a conversation that ultimately will benefit the kids. So I think that that's 
a really, really cool way for you to frame that. And I, I think it really is emblematic of everything that you've said over the course of the hour today. So, so Liana, thank you for sharing your time today. I hope you and your husband and your three boys remain safe and in good health. And thank you for all you do to engage students Aww. in the joy of learning. Thanks, Josh. Aloha, everyone. Hopefully you learn you learned something and I'd love to wonder along with you folks. That's great. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Okay, bye, Josh. This podcast is inspired by the book, What School Could Be. Please join the global What School Could Be virtual online community by going to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or by downloading the What School Could Be app from your favorite app store. Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. The What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Your host is me, Josh Rapoon. This series is funded by education change agent Ted Dintersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film, Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the bestseller, What School Could Be. Send your feedback to mltsinhawaii at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at mltsinhawaii and at Josh Rapoon. Finally, please like our Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii Facebook page and YouTube channel. Friends, stay safe, wear a mask, and please get vaccinated. Most of all, please bring kindness and compassion into the world. We need a surplus of both right now. Until next time, ahui ho and take care. <laughs>